Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO The Last of Europe in which we're playing as everyone's favorite state of Kemerobo. Now I've technically already played as Kemerobo before but by the end of that campaign I had chosen I think the female uh, successor route but this time someone asked me to do the male successor route but we're going to go with that route. The People's Prince. Prince Yuri roamed through the bustling town center full of people going about their lives, buying from the markets, enjoying a day at the park and gossiping to one another. He really enjoyed coming here and being around all the people who were just going about their daily lives and enjoying what they can. It was somewhat calm and a good break from the throne room and the cynical sister. There was something of putting off putting Halvard. Wherever Yuri went, there was a sense of fear. Fear of bandits, raids, of invasions from other warlords, and the fear that the family wouldn't have enough to eat that night. It was there in almost everywhere Yuri went. If people couldn't live like this, Yuri thought. All the dread and despair deep inside everyone, it was unbearable. Every time he went to visit the town, he felt like something had to be done. Anything to prove the people's lives, at least somewhat. That was what he was thinking. He was a prince. If someone could do something to help the people, it was him. Sure, his father did seem to care a lot for his kingdom, but from what Yuri saw, it wasn't enough. More had to be done if Kemerov were to be the grand kingdom that cared for its people. The people deserved better in the reign of the Mad King. Nikolai Krylov, now known as the Rook II, has so far proved to be an exceptionally eccentric ruler. His rule thus far has demonstrated his continuous ability to contradict himself on several subjects, and few believe that this ability will end anytime soon. The Mad King has also decided upon strengthening the military in order to strike out against her neighbors, which he sees as rebellious subjects. It's clearly plenty the king has to do before he uh, can embark on the warpath. The king's children are both attempting to persuade his highness to follow their visions for how to prepare the kingdom for the future wars. Judgments will have to be made on whether to follow the populist policies of Prince Yuri or the brutal pragmatism of Princess Lydia. Ruck needs to, will need to determine the direction of the economy the army and society wishes to establish. Once these challenges have been overcome, we can set out on the warpath. The king's industry. Ooh. More growth. The king's society. King's army. We have the king's industry. After the uh, past deterioration of our standing in the region, it was assumed that we were doomed to obscurity due to our complete lack of fortune. Or so assumed, after all, we still control the industrial city of Kemerovo. Everybody to utilize and advance the output of the city, producing new guns and equipment, equipping freshly trained soldiers, and extending these plans to enhance our infrastructure, and improve the mobility of our army and workers. Maybe we could once again take our place as a relevant contender in the region under the ambitious king Rurik the second, the Wolf Princess, though. The Wolf Princess prowled through the halls of King Rurik's court. Princess Lydia enjoyed watching her father make decisions. The ruler had to be decisive. A wrong decision could turn the entire empire upside down. Monarchs were the best for laying down the law of the land, and thus they knew how to use their authority. So ever since the end of the wars in Russia and Siberia, the Karyla family had changed. With the father carving out a five to in central Siberia, the entire family had, had their own idea of how to fix Russia. The princess uh, felt the best way to lead the kingdom was with a strong autocrat, as a strong autocrat. Prince Yuri, however, on the other hand, thought the best ways to follow the opinions of the people. Where he was idealistic, she was pragmatic. Where her brother was pacifistic, she was militaristic, ironic, considering her past as a nurse, but necessary in the new order of things. Her brother just didn't understand the rule they now lived in. Did he really think that all enemies surrounded them would just hand over their control to their father? And no, that's where Yuri would fall and fail. He, her goal wasn't to sit in Kemerovo and try to grow more food for the people while bandits continue to raid farms and murder their owners. Her goal, their family's goal, was to arena at Russia. Only then could the people be fed and their lives be improved. Russia could not be made whole if they couldn't make some small sacrifices. Lydia had to make sure her father made the right decisions. After all, the ends justify the means. Be the union leaders. Ooh, that's not bad. Sponsor cultural events. I kind of like this one, but I do want to make sure that we do this the Siberian planet, which isn't as strong as it used to be, which sucks, but whatever. Um... Uh, where now? Uh, the most influential advisor is Yuri, which is cool. His Majesty's eccentricities. The call Nik General Nikolai Krylov of Uruk, the second eccentric, was perhaps the largest understatement in all of Russia. He woke in the early hours of the morning before anyone else in the household. He was constantly drunk and shied away from loud noises. He spoke softly, yet firmly, and exactly, seemed exactly of sound mind, even while addressing himself at Tsar. Or firmly insisting he'd be called Uruk, the second to everyone who called him General Krylov by his old name. Occasionally, the servants muse among themselves about the king while he roamed the palace or resided on his throne. Was he truly mad? What was, what was this what the horrors of war brought? No. Others argue the general was merely putting on an act to confuse and bewilder others, yet all of them knew the others had no concrete answer. The Tsar certainly gave none. And then what of them? What of it with them? <clears throat> and they were following a lunatic who was a benevolent one who treated them quite well. And they were following a man talented enough to put, down, put on such an act, and clearly they were working for one of the greatest minds of Siberia. These thoughts at least put them at ease as the breaks ended, or it's all caught call for them. Yet, still, this question lingered. A strange man in an even stranger land. Now, I think it went this way last time. I'm pretty sure I did. I could be very wrong. I'm not sure these changed at all, but still. Um, we definitely want to get this one very quickly, so will the people, academic base, let's do the king's army. The royal armed forces are pitifully small and armed with only the most basic of weapons. The commanders 
uh, tactics are ancient, dating back to the German invasion. The military needs to be changed if we want to have any hope of defending ourselves and defeating the rebellious subjects outside our borders. To make an army, our king must be proud of. Our small forces must be increased to a full standing army to defend the nation. That means even more men will need to join the forces if we want to have a chance of victory. We must also increase our military production to arm the new recruits. Lastly, our tactics must be retouched to fight a modern war in the Siberian Waste, and the Royal Army must never lose. Well, we lose, we get stability, but we lose it eventually later. Well, as, as long as, uh, you know, most influential advisors, Yuri, I mean, I think, we're, I think we'll be okay for now. Scavenging for loot, of course. And what else do we have here? Let me do that one. How much political power do we get a day? 1.46 is very strong. Holy crap, that's very, 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 very strong. And if that's a case, I don't mind improving the, uh, growth rate. Because we have a yearly plus now. We don't have any growth, which is not good. But, oh well. We still need a bigger economy. Ah, uh, come in. Nice. Right, so now it's going to explode the debt a little bit more, but whatever. King's Industry and the King's Army. The Royal Economy, Lev Vosnesinski, the first Royal Minister of Finance, poured himself a glass of water from the pitcher on the table, downing it in one gulp like it was a shot of vodka. Yum. He had definitely wished it was, however. Today, to deal with the Royal Family, Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia were all by were by all accounts upsetting people on their own. But when put in the same room, they were as dangerous as a combination of nitric acid and glycerin. How dare you insult the Royal Unions like that? If you were my sister, I'd have you thrown in prison for that. Oh, please, they're economic poison. You'll stand by those idiots because their support is easy to buy. If you ever want any hope of improving your economy, we need. What we need is someone who's actually studied finance and didn't spend all day learning how to stitch wounds. Why, you... <clears throat> Vosnesinski loudly cleared his throat. Let me try and understand this, Prince Yuri. You suggest that His Majesty concentrate on workers' rights reforms in order to improve the quality of life. And Princess Lydia, you support lowering subsidies and rolling back regulation to free up more funding for your hospital expansion program. Am I correct in these assumptions? Both nobles silently nodded. Very well. While both are sound ideas, I shall attentively, might I add, look into the feasibility of implementing His Highness' proposal. Wolves in the throne room. The throne in the throne in the throne room sat empty as the two wolves circled each other, burying their teeth while with eyes pointing daggers at each other. King Rook had decided to take a short break, leaving the prince and the princess without their king. It was once a peaceful throne room had been transformed into a battleground just as Rook walked out the door. You two have, have, have you have no care for the people, Yuri cried, angered at how Lydia would just ignore the people's plight. All you want is for the powerful to gain more power and crush their own subjects. Do you have no empathy at all? How do you think a kingdom is supposed to be run, brother Lydia replied cynically? It's not like we can magically rain down wealth and equality among every subject. This isn't your dream world, Yuri. Get over it. Of course it's not, Yuri said, starting to get angry. He knew Lydia liked it when he got angry, but he didn't care. However, we can't ignore what our subjects are going through every day. The poor are starving in this bandit-ridden wasteland, and you don't care. Oh no, Yuri's poor little friends outside the plaza are hungry. Whatever will we do, Lydia replied with a sarcastic tone. Yuri stared down at the floor glum. We really are polar opposites, aren't we? Lydia laughed. You finally got something right for once. The walls continue to circle with a standing army. To defeat our enemies, we cannot have an untrained rabble. The corps of military must be made up of professional soldiers who are willing to fight for a king and his ideals. With the well-trained professional military, even the largest enemies can be bested. We shall stand above the other traitorous warlords who wish to conquer and destroy our kingdom. While it may take some time to fully professionalize our military, it will be worth it in the end. Better training and better officers will whip the troops into shape. Our army will be the most distinguished and magnificent in Siberia. Screw the Siberian plan. We've got an economy to save. Uh, defensive doctrine is not bad. The Royal Army, tapping his finger impatiently on the table, he sat at work and patiently waited the appointed time. He was about to get up and leave when he heard the sound of approaching boots and looked over in their direction to see his old friend Alexander Shevstov. Well, Shevstov. Ah, oh, finally there you are. <clears throat> My sincerest apologies, Rurik Shevstov. Spoke softly and calmly, as though without worry, and took a seat at the other end of the table, drilling the men took longer than I thought it would. Well, well, you always seem to be very uh, dutiful, haven't you? Even back in those simpler times in the Red Army. Flashing an amused smile, uh, Shevstov nodded. Yes, I suppose I've been having eye, and now I, that I serve you, it's my pride to work even harder. No, 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 uh, no. Ooh, ooh. Though we made an attempt to hide it, it was clear to Shevstov that Rurik wasn't really listening. Is there something wrong, Rurik? No, no, nothing, I assure you, Rurik said hurriedly. It's just, do you ever miss being in the Red Army, Alexander Grigorovich? Despite his best efforts, Shevstov couldn't discern what Rurik was feeling. Honestly, it would be the best policy, he decided. On occasion, he admitted. I can't say I feel anything either way for the ideology, but they, they weren't all wrong either, and those were happier days for almost everybody. <clears throat> I think it's perfectly normal to miss them. I see, Rurik said, letting out a long sigh that I didn't hear that from somebody else. Thank you. Anytime, my friend. Let's remain friends, Alexander Grigorovich, to the end of our days. Move, you godforsaken dogs, Ivan Yakovlev barked at the cadets as they ran through the obstacle course. This Is this the best you can muster to defend your motherland? I've seen Babushka's total rifle better than that. 
Yvonne looked at the men and sighed. They were miserable, no doubt. Most of them were probably farmers' sons. Used to hard labor, but not this much exertion for so long. He could see the resentment in their eyes, which he figured was a start. He would rather have trained men who hated him than green men who adored him. Men, Yvonne began. You may be wondering why I have you out here since dawn with no food and me breathing down your necks at the slightest mistake. I know you are suffering. In fact, I want you to be suffering because the more you suffer here, the less you will suffer out there. I'd rather your legs give out on the obstacle course than on the march. I'd rather your first date without food be in the camp than in a foxhole, and I would certainly rather you find out your limits training than in battle against the Tsar's foes. I don't expect your love, I don't expect your thanks, I don't expect that even the slightest hint of warmth from any of you, but what I do expect is that you will fight when ordered and keep fighting until your body can fight no more, am I clear? If I received a chorus of yes sirs in response. Good, now run the course again, he blew the whistle, and the men scrambled to the start of the course. Faster, you horse sons, faster. Your fathers would weep in shame at the sight. Our times create strong men. Support the unions? Not bad. I want to get academic base, but this, I see this monthly military professionalism change, and I'm like, yes, please. Uh, Revolutionary King is pretty good, too. More defense is nice. More political power, too. Uh, let's go with the conscriptive force. A large army is required to defend a realm, and the only possible way to increase our military size is conscription. Our army will be backed up by conscripts, which should be giving us a lot more infantry to be able to train with. This gives us a chance to mobilize that infantry, which will be able to back up more and more heavier armed regular infantry in wartime. Still, this won't be popular with the people. We need to conscript laborers and farmers, and then they won't be happy with, le happy with leaving their homes and workplaces. Unfortunately, this is a sacrifice all we'll need to make in order to defend our king and our land. And I apologize for slowing my words. I just read so much every day, and it's like, I start slowing stuff very... Quite often, honestly. Quite often. We lose political power, but we get more daily army speed, which is not bad. Yeah. Get down here, then get down here, and then we'll change it up. Maybe. Ooh, I'll get some two more production units, lines of infantry. Columns of tanks. As much as I want tanks, I just don't see the point of it. I'm pretty sure I went with lines of infantry last time, but if you want to read about columns of tanks, please go right ahead. Nice. Max it out. Can't raid anybody. It's like no one has loot. And we don't have a lot of divisions anyway, so... Defensive Doctrine. With the current state of Russia, invasion could come at any time, anywhere. Fortifications, watchtowers, and radar stations must be constructed in an easily defendable position so that we know when and where an invasion is coming. With our enemies most likely outnumbering us, the army must be trained to defend and ambush. The kingdom must always stay on guard in the forts, bunkers, and trenches. Our enemies on all sides cannot be given any sort of advantage. A severely undefended camera will be turned into a fortress. Pretty much. That's always the goal, man. Oh, God. Those Revolutionary Council? I don't know. Trying to do that seems like a bad idea. CSR? I'm trying to train two, train two divisions. Oops. But they're only okay. They're not great. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Get some every day. It's not bad. All right. Your life for the king. Actually, let's probably read this one next. All men who serve in the king's army must have complete and undeniable loyalty. Each individual soldier needs to be completely devoted to the king and his commands. Even even everyone, from the scout to the officer, must be willing to give his life for the service of the king. Better training and combat will make each soldier an elite and mighty force to be reckoned with. Each man in the king's army will fight like five of our enemies. Troops must also be duly educated to serve the king in the realm. There's no room for insolence or treachery in the royal military. Wartime industry. While our men may be well trained, they're nothing without weapons. To keep up with the expanding army, we must continue to grow our military industry. We'll be no match for the oncoming conflicts. We don't have enough guns or supplies for our troops. We'll focus on arms production, mass producing weapons, and ammo for the troops on the front lines. What industry we have must also be prepared for war. If more weapons are produced than consumer goods, then so be it. A man without a gun is nothing. Pretty much. What a strange arrival. An odd occurrence has been reported to us from a security force and range along the border with Crest Noirs. Apparently, an American of all people appeared and subsequently requested entry into the Principality. Although initially detained on suspicion of being infiltrated from Andres Traders' regime, the man provided ample proof of both his American citizenship, as well as continued journey across Siberia from Petropavlovsk so far to Krasnoyarsk. Could he further explain that he's on a journey across from Russia to east to west, visiting as many nations as possible and investigating their cultures, with no reason to detain the American further, and no instructions from the central government to reject entry. He was permitted to continue through the border region. He is expected to arrive in Kemerovo itself in short order. How curious. 
Entry 12, the Principality of Kemerovo. When I first crossed into Kemerovo, I thought everything I had been told in Kemerovo was true. The border guards were most unfriendly until I proved who I was, but now, having been in Kemerovo for a few days, the things are not as I thought they would be. The city is clean and orderly, as long as you ignore all the coal dust from the Kutznets Basin. People seem relatively friendly, and I'm certainly not seeing all the unpleasantness I did in Zaya, or Kutsk, or in the territory of the Black Army. Zoya certainly seems to enjoy it, at the very least. Far stranger than the city, however, is the government. As far as I can tell, the rulers of Red Army General who had a breakdown began calling himself Emperor Rurik II. It doesn't seem like anyone can really explain to me what his actual goals are. The ones who tell me, or they can tell me about, however, and very loudly are his children, Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia. Yuri seems to have taken ideas similar to Valerie regarding unions and the like, and wants to move towards a democratic system. His sister seems much harsher, wanting to continue absolutism, and claiming it as a simple necess necessity towards keeping order in a place as lawless as Siberia. It shook me a bit as to how much sense that made to me. For I said so, I would have supported Yuri, absolutely, but after what I've seen so far in Siberia, I can't discount Lydia's opinion so easily anymore. In any case, I spoke with Zoya, and tomorrow we'll be heading southward towards Biusk. I'll pin the capital of a small nation of Orthodox believers. I wonder what it will be like. I wonder which sibling will win. Do your part. Ever since King Rurik had proclaimed himself as such, life in Kemerov has been difficult, or different. The medieval revivalism that had followed the establishment of his dynasty resulted in some strange occurrences, and it's one such as the one that now drew a crowd of curious and confused onlookers. A group of workmen, accompanied by several policemen and soldiers, had arrived and were approximately halfway through the painting of an enormous mural on the side of a building overlooking a public square. The content of the mural was clear, joined the military, but the artwork was not. For many attendants, it reminded them of the standard practice of the old Soviet artwork, with clear elements of socialist realism reflected in the depictions of the smiling and proud soldiers intended to be on display for others. Or perhaps for those younger and the few, with fewer and less well-established memories of the old union, it was very different. The heavy lines and dark shadows, all oriented towards emphasizing a central figure in an almost religious light, all evoked memories of the medieval style of the old Rurikid principalities that had been seen in museums, history books, and other such sources. This fusion was, as all agreed, at least interesting, if not particularly attractive. Of course, no one dared such voice such a perspective. Not with the police closely watching, but the thought remained. To varying degrees inside each of those watching, a fusion of both old and, of course, much older. Through the fog, in the distant room of Kemerovo, wherein resides a Tsar of all the Russias, there's a great concrete bunker monolith not far from the capital itself. In that great concrete monolith, guarded by grim-faced veterans with rifles and a vast spreading iron dish atop it, as a crew that seats farther than human eyes find possible. Theirs is the domain of the radar, of course. And they're led by Pavel Zelensky of the Royal Army. Pavel glares at one of his subordinates as they poke and prod at their dials and redoubts. So what news then? What now, Lilia? Did you see something flying in the air or to call me in and alert everyone in the room? Ilya stiffens attention. Sir, something on the dial. There's a dot. Let me see. Pavel's shoulders past another curious conscript. Looked at the readout and puts a manual out of his pocket. The room here is more curses and more languages than most Americans can dream of. And Pavel nods decisively as he finds what he's look searching for in the manual. See? A meaty finger stabs at the page as Ilya crowds in a closer look. He saw a bird you idiot, a bird, not a bomber. At that point, Volodya, the youngest of the conscripts assigned to Air Defense Station, Kem Rebel chimes in, so let's measure means Ilya can find us dinner, right? It winks at the other crewmen, I mean, not as if someone's going to ask if we're going to bag a bird or two from the roof. Pavel to his credit as an NCO is just size. Sometimes it's just a bird, but we have lines of infantry to talk about, too. We must focus primarily on our infantry, the backbone of our military. They'll be the ones who will defend their borders and march into our enemy's capitals. A well-trained and devoted army march match with the best guns Siberia has to offer will win every war. Our army can have no flaws whatsoever if we want to be at the top in the coming struggle. More gun support equipment and artillery will keep our infantry armed and allow us to continue to expand our military. The soldiers will, shall reach peak performance in battle and we will outclass all of our enemies. There's no place in the king's army for inferiority. Amen. So after that one, uh, we did raid these guys over here too, so... Wartime industry, lines of infantry, followed up with what? Support the unions, electronics. The King Society. The order of the Kingdom Society is yet to be determined. Two clear options from His Highness's children have emerged. First, the ideals of Prince Yuri, which would remarkably improve the political rights of the people of Kemerovo and promote equality among the population. Alternatively, Princess Lydia offers a more pragmatic vision of Kemerovo's uh, society, which would entail closer links with the military and enforcement of the strict hierarchy to ensure stability. Whatever King Rurik decides to follow, uh, we will have an increase in their power and influence within their own. Pretty normal. Pretty darn normal. Production facility networks? Why not? Seems okay to me. Hey, we actually have some growth. Basically none. But some growth. Nonetheless. Good god, we need more divisions. Yes, Orosia. That's nice. Yes, please. Gladly raid them. Gladly, gladly, gladly raid them. As we get more equipment as well. Uh, Poverty rate change, not great, but looking better. The People's Apocalypse, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. 
a haunting tale. Uh, what can I do with our political power first? Ooh, can we wait to do the one for 65? Yeah, we can. Tribute, pay tribute, awesome. Okay, there you go. Pay debt. Very nice. Thank you very much. Workers, let's do schools. Hey, divisions. Very good. Oh, they're getting ready as well, maybe. Awesome. And Prince Yuri's ideals. Crown Prince Yuri, the heir to the throne, has attempted to influence the king to make reforms, increase the freedoms, and power of the people. The prince argues that his idealistic vision will inspire people, whereas his sister's bleak and repressive structure for society will only recreate resentment. A liberated population will limit resistance to the rule of the king, our subjects throughout the rest of central Siberia, whilst be less inclined to resist us. Prince Yuri assures his highness that these adjustments will ensure the realm's stability and prospects for the future, as we support the unions. Following the decision made by his highness on the employment of the industry of Kemerobo, it is obvious that we should set about expanding our production, but what remains unanswered is how long this will be enacted. Crown Prince Yuri, uh, Kradlov has expressed his support for the existing trade unions, emphasizing how expansion of our output will never be sustainable without the support of the workers in the factories. This choice will pose a bizarre conflict to the new monarchy which his majesty has created, but such an unusual contra contradiction will be nothing new to those who know the king. Nice. I apologize for speaking very fast, too. Life under the king. Ivan had lived in Kemerova for as long as he could remember, and during that time he had seen the rise and fall of the Central Siberian Republic. And the chaos, of course, that followed. Ivan had come to expect the unexpected during his many years as an industrial worker, but not even he could expect someone like King Rurik II to take charge. The king, long may he reign, was certainly a strange one, especially considering that Ivan remembered the times that he used to call himself General Krylov and would stagger out of the old Gorkum headquarters to give slurred speeches about traitors and mutiny. Despite the king's many many eccentricities, old King Rurik II seemed to be a good man to follow. He hadn't done anything malicious or harmful to the people like Ivan so far. In fact, he seemed to really be dedicated to taking care of the Kemerovo people. It made sure that the common man felt safe and protected, which Ivan had thought impossible ever since the Huns took Moscow. As though Fetzel's palace might be a tad odd, but when he gave a speech, even a weary old man like Ivan felt in awe. Ivan felt like the King's Rurik's strange old regime had a decent enough shot of liberating Russia from its many fractured rulers. Of King Rurik II ended up ruling all of Russia, why Ivan felt like that wouldn't be too bad. Long live the people's king. More construction speed. I like construction speed. Oh, worker growth. Oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Concessions. Meh. Who gives a crap about that? In the court of Jarl's life, all around the hall, the heady scent of jubilance permeated the air. The soldiers of the King's Guard, mighty and of many privileges within the lands of the Lord, a celebrated great victory against surprisingly deadly foes. In emulation of the traditions of the old Rus, they had overtaken a local watering hole in Kemerovo to celebrate. Bandits were constant plague within the corpse of the Soviet Union, and on any other day, the death of another barely coherent rabble would be of little concern to the King's Guard. This time, though, the bandits have fought more akin to a Soviet Guard's regiment than any bandit lord's troops. The battle had been fierce, and many brave souls have fallen, but the tenacity of the Guard cannot be denied amid this raucous celebration, an anomaly could be seen. In a quiet corner of the bar, seated with some more, gr more grizzled veterans of the Guard, was a stranger. The man looked almost painfully average. His eyes were a simple brown, and his hair was of a similar shade of his features beyond that none could remember. The vodka had flown liberally and left holes in the memories. The stranger was an honored guest of the King's Guard, and as had been integral to the Guard's success in that fateful battle. Every once in a while, one of the younger men would break off and offer a drink to the man, and every time he would lightly decline. Instead, he would buy the man who offered a drink and send them on their way. He spent the night in quiet conversation with the veterans. None knew what their words they exchanged. Though the one thing everyone present would remember was a melancholy smile that left the stranger's face only when he set out into the wilderness the next morning. A bittersweet memory of comrades long past. And the will of the people. Now that His Highness has determined on following a more progressive approach to our economy, we shall endeavor to begin laying out the new foundations of our supportive economy. New legislation will be put into place to protect the rights of the kingdom's wool and diligent industrial workers and unions will be strengthened. Popular policy like these will be necessary if we are to keep our working classes devoted to the cause of the king. For the will of the people shall not be ignored for as long as King Rurik II is left around to hear it. Nice. I want to raid more now. This extraction's okay. Get on to. Now we're looking for a Siberian plan. Not bad. Could do more output. More guns, just more factories in general. You know, the usual. Actually, do we have any motorized? Oh, we don't have a motorized here, huh? That was a mistake. We're definitely going to need some motorized here, but happy October, everybody. Thank you. Support the unions. Will the people. Empower the king. Empower the king. Of course, we were, I already read this one earlier, so. Yeah, the change of uh, authoritarian democracy is not bad. All the king's workers. So if you want to read this... Did I read this one? I think I read this one already, yeah. 
If you want to read this again, please go ahead. Maybe did I? I can't remember. I also can't. Yeah. Uruk II, with the assistance of his cane and his son-in-law, or son in tow, made his way into the meeting room that had been arranged for him and one of the most influential Union bosses in the kingdom, Boris Kelchev. Rook had been, at, at, been at, apprehensive about meeting with the unions, yet Yuri had merely managed to convince his old man to come to this meeting. Boris could be found examining every part of the room in confusion, silently questioning why the heck half of his contents were there. What did Rurik need a hearth for in a conference room? And a pair of axes cross over one another against a shield mounted on the wall above the doorway? Were they real axes? This guy's nuts, thought Boris, as Rurik lowered himself into a seat. Well, let's get this over, began Rurik, before being cut off abruptly by the prince, who was already red with embarrassment. Well, sorry, sir. My father is entirely sympathetic to your cause. He's just rather blunt when he's up to this early. Go on, father, began Yuri, looking pleadingly towards his father. Right, right. Well, Boris, may I call you Boris? Continued Rurik. That's my name, yes, replied the union boss. Well, then, let me just say that, so long as you stay within the bounds of the law, you have the full support of the crown behind you. Boris smiled as this news, although was only cautiously optimistic. The prince seemed over fully devoted to helping the unions, but Boris got distinct dragged along, feeling from the way the king himself spoke. What exactly do you mean when you say support? You'll be guaranteed more rights as workers, and your unions will be able to operate as they wish within the confines of the law. Should businesses infringe on said rights, it will be considered a crime, and they will be punished as the kingdom sees fit. Hey, that's a heck of a lot better than the other deals have been offered. Let's get down to specifics, then, shall we? Um, yeah, right here is a bad, 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 bad idea. As, long, as weak as that division is, eh, that's still mountains. And our divisions aren't that strong, so there's literally no point to do that. Uh, we could do that one. We could definitely want to do this one. They have no loot. They don't have loot. Roshi has no loot. No, Sabiris has been loot, but it's been raided in the past three months, so. No point, yep. Well, the people. And his ideals, of course. Hmm, I'll do the research facilities, gives us more political power. Stability. Hmm, it's not bad. Kingdom of equals, and eh, more political power, why not? The Crown Prince will continue to advocate and implement his ideals across the realm, and now he plans to promote programs that will improve equality throughout the kingdom. This, the Prince argues, will help dramatically improve the lives of the most impoverished members of society. Prince Yuri, the People's Prince, has become known, continues to receive a large amount of popularity than the public, which in turn has increased his influence in the King's court. An expansion of Prince Yuri's authority will be good news for the poor, who generally believe that he has interest, their interests at heart. Honeyed words. The miners all emerging from the deep shafts of the mine around Kuznets Basin has completed their long and tiring shifts and as usual proceeded to the local drinking establishment for a well-deserved rest. Ordinarily, the men would talk about the shift and about their plans for the shift still ahead, but tonight there was a different topic of discussion. King Rook's radio address. He had, in recent days, been speaking of changes to the state's laws and regulations around labor rights, and the introduction of new legislation. No doubt the men agreed prompted by Prince Yuri. Well, all of them were pleased to uh, pleased by the news. Uh, given the liberalization's promise, all were similarly skeptical. After all, a change had been promised before, and more than once, it proven illusory, illusory at best. One man raised the concern that the Zemsky Sabor would model implementation, and another voice certainly uh, that Princess Lydia and her co coterie would act to subvert any expansion so codified. But even with such concerns, there was hope. The general trend of state policy lately had been encouraging, and there was a natural tendency to believe that it would continue. The things would get better. The men spoke on this late into the evening. When they were done, they laughed deeply in the need of sleep, legislation or no legislation. They worked tomorrow, and that work never ended. Their dreams were hopeful. Yeah, kingdom of equals. Increased influence. Good for him. I just want to raid you until you die. Give me your money. We're looking here. Oh, we're about to get upgraded to mediocre. We're just poor. But maybe someday we won't be poor. Maybe we'll just be mediocre. And maybe we'll get streamlined focal production facilities as well. Decrease production efficiency gain, but increase max output. Because right now our efficiency cap is pretty low. Oh, hello. CSR? Can we beat Tomsk? I kind of want to wait till these guys, because we should be pretty close to getting these guys. Oh, they were just been raided. Okay. Here's ideals. And... There you go. Oh! Oh, well, they've been raiding the past 90 days, too, apparently. Oh, those guys were born. Yeah, I'll get that one next. King Rook's revolutionary past. Oh! Of Krasnoyarsk. Oh, crap. Oh. 
Uh, Prince Yuri has decided to popularize the old vows that King Rurik fought for when he was serving as a revolutionary soldier of the Soviet Union. After the mass has been reminded of the king's history, they will be reassured that the rights they have maintained so far will be protected. Considering how Rurik has already preserved the state atheism of the Soviet Union, a continuation of such policies will come in as no surprise. His majesty will protect all from injustice, as he always has and always will. Should do fairly well against these guys. They're not really maxed out. I've played as a uh, Crescent Arts though before. 90,000 manpower is quite a bit. They've only th two to three divisions, though. So. And he's defeated. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, do that too. Might as well, since we're here. Bully Krasnoy Arsk. And you don't bully them harder. Abuse them. Sure, why not? 1% growth is better than no percent growth. Since we're here anyways, we might as well go in, right? Right. Oh no, it's glitched. No! Well, that sucks. Uh, we'll do this one and we'll see if we can fix that, maybe. Hopes of a prince. Prince Yuri stepped up in front of the Sabor, clearing his throat before the speech he was about to make. Fellow people of this great kingdom, as you may be nobles, priests, or commoners, I welcome you, and as you know, the current state of Russia is not ideal. Poverty and banditry are rampant, and the starvation is enorm. Warfare has destroyed what we were once great cities, and will continue to do so. Yuri began to speak louder now, more energizing than ever felt before. This cannot continue to go on. Something has to be done. The people of our kingdom cannot to continue to live in impoverishment. That's why I believe everyone deserves equality under the king. F life in fear and terror is not a way to live. If we are to be a modern kingdom, we need to follow new ways. Well, further people must be assured a king and his government cannot ignore their own citizens. Yuri looked around the room to see the people's reactions. Were they happy, eager even? It was hard to tell, so Yuri continued. That is why I hope this realm can become a better one. One with a parliamentary democracy where everyone can have their voices heard and the king can act in the will of his subjects. Those are my hopes and my dreams. Let us work together to make them come true. A truly a man with the people at heart. The Zemsky Sabor reform. The next, next major step in Prince's reforms is the reformation of the king's assembly. The Zemsky Sabor, not used since the 17th century. The Sabor had been recreated in its Kemerovo to give the subjects access to the king. Giving more power to the Sabor will make the people's voice even more important to the king. It will also bring Prince Yuri closer to building a truly democratic and representative parliamentary monarchy that serves the people. A new Sabor would be very good for us, too. And we did raid these guys, and we were successful. I think I just clicked on it too fast. I think that was the biggest issue I had there. Um, let's make sure we're not using outdated guns, probably first, because that's probably what we're doing right now. Using outdated weaponry. And unfortunately, I am correct. Terrible, I know. Uh, I can't do really anything yet. Can't can't do too much. Rurigan's production facilities network, which wouldn't be bad, but I want to get uh, more power grids just because we are at 13 versus 12, which is not good. Not good whatsoever. Debt is still 0.426, which is not terrible. Even though now we do have a yearly deficit, which is not ideal, but it's a necessary thing to have to happen. So that's the case. We're going to cut this one down because we're going to expand these divisions. Six is good. I want more. There you go. So we'll be power grids just in case, and they'll keep working on this stuff up here too. And wait to uh, scavenge for more loot. Our realm secure. The changes to the king's new society made and the wolves appeased, if only temporarily. Our sake and focus its attention on other concerns in preparation for our expansion. The new model of society started to bring stability to the realm, something that has relieved everyone from the farmer toiling on the collective farm to the king himself. His Highness hopes that the internal squabbles between his children have ended, not just for the sake of his own threadbare sanity, but also the kingdom's longevity as a whole. Yeah, this part doesn't even matter. I think you get perfectly balanced. That's all things should be, but still. Cool. Train, 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 train. We'll keep one, but when we do attack, it'll be with some thick daddies. Go this 18 combo with for now and grab some logistics. You might as well go and throw them on. That's fine. Um, I do want to get some planes, helicopter planes. Maybe we might not use recon in this, this campaign, but we'll see. I'm scared. Very good. That's going to drastically increase the cost, but whatever. It's worth it. Power of the Sabor. <clears throat> the persistent urging of the Prince Yuri has finally gotten to King Uruk, and the power of the Zemsky Sabor is already seeing an increase. While not limiting the power of Uruk much, the voice of the people and the government of affairs has greatly increased. 
Now, Rurik has the opportunity to hear the opinions of his subjects even more, and it's safe to say the kingdom is slowly moving towards democracy. Whilst this does give more power to the common people of Kemerovo, the added power has also increased the influence of... Oh, God, no. Um, <clears throat> uh, increase... Uh, maybe influence of the nobles and priests as well. The common people may now be able to voice their opinions now, but the rich nobleman now has the opportunity to use this influence in other means. The reform of Sabor may not be perfect, but in Yuri's mind, the more voice the people have been in the government, uh, the better. And while Yuri may be satisfied for now, there's so much for the prince wants to see changed for the kingdom, which can become a better place for everyone. Now it was just the beginning of a new kingdom, a better kingdom, and now there's so much more to be done, of course. On the power of the king, his highness has heard about the outcry of the people, and he has listened. Our recent attempts at restructuring the economy proved very popular with the poor members of our society. Improvements in the conditions of the workers have already begun to improve, along with the popular support for the king's rule. But if these trends are to continue, the power will have to remain in the hands of the king. After all, his grace has proved himself to be a worthy leader of the working classes. The cooperation of the people with the authority of the monarch will be required of our economy is, of course, to improve. Which it should, no matter what. Central Siberian Republic. Why well, do we do have seven divisions? Now we got a lot of political power. It's great. Let me could try it. We don't have a lot of info on them, though. And on the warpath. With our internal problems settled with, it's time to go forth and conquer the name of the king in Kemerovo. Only through expansion can Rook secure his crown in the realm for those who wish to destroy it. We cannot wait for the invaders to come to us. We must destroy them first and liberate those who cry out for the harmony and security. Now the warlords who surround us must not be allowed to enslave their people any longer. Rook will lead us to glory and conquest, and we will finally triumph over our enemies. A day with a family. We should probably best stop training right now. And this as well. Offensive, yes. The Krylovs are not your standard run of the mill family. With two siblings of Gruri and Lydia, how could it be? Any discussion between those bound to lead to disaster. Uh, <clears throat> bring the whole family together. Even Boris had not cared much about the running of the kingdom. Rurik has had hopes that this will finally end his children's squabbles. As each year the children entered, this thing started well. Rurik decided to steer towards something all of them would enjoy the unification of central Siberia under him as king. It wasn't long until Lydia decided to take the conversation in a different direction, though. If we want to unify the region, the military needs even more funding, Father. We can make sure that we can conquer our enemies swiftly before any of them can pull up a strong resistance. What are you talking about, Lydia? Yuri said. Oppose anything she said. More has to be done for her subjects, not the military. Besides, should we not try to approach things diplomatically first? Are you that naive, brother? Lydia responded coldly. Do you think, really think, that the surrounding warlords would just let us peacefully integrate them? The Germans will just hand back Moscow? No, well, Yuri started to the delight of Lydia. No, I. We quite both of you, King Rurik interjected. Angry that nothing had changed between them. Despite all of his efforts, I brought you here so you could finally get along for the sake of the kingdom. I'll just end your bickering, Boris. If you haven't said much, what do you think we should do next? Boris looked at his two siblings, both angrily eyeing him uh, and as he prepared to speak. I don't know, father, whatever sounds best to you. Yuri, Prince Yuri and Lydia started the arguing match, both trying to get their point across. Yuri sighed as he felt another headache come on, tired of this quarrel that seemed to divide the entire kingdom. Maybe when they're older. Are you ready for this? No? Didn't think so. But that gives us time for this one, too. Now, these guys are probably pretty thick. Yeah, they're pretty darn thick, which is not good for us. They are fighting over river in our divisions. Well, we did try to make a slightly bigger division. And we do have a uh, digging modifier factor, 0%. Not as hopeful as I hoped it would be, but whatever. But we're still doing okay under, who's this guy? Andriev? No, Yakov Bronin Lichtenstein. Italian Levant partition where peace last. Oh, great. Good job, guys. Machine raid. They're looking very weak. I think they're out of guns, maybe. Give us a few more days for stability first, and then we'll invade them. Ah, oh, that's enough time. Oh, come on. Again, why? Look okay, at this one, though. Okay, I'm okay. As long as we get Orochia, I'm okay with that. This whole glitch thing, I don't understand why it's bugged. Economy for the modern age. We have at long last completed the necessary reforms to our industry that will develop a suitable base for future production. The direction of the royal economy has ultimately been decided, for better or for worse, the days of our ineffective economy are gone. And Camarabo has truly become home to an economy fit for the modern age. The extra capacity that our changes have brought will prove instrumental to our future prospects in the region. His Majesty is pleased with the kingdom's progress, and so now there's a lot less holding back the king's immense ambitions. I, I forgot to read that one, so my bad. My bad. Rumors of discontent continue. 
All across Central Siberia, working conditions are starting to improve. More safety in the mines and longer breaks for the factory workers have all been put into place to satisfy the workers. Pay wages have even increased to stop the workers from striking. It seems that the cries of the workers have been answered. Despite our efforts, though, there's still rumors of discontent spreading wildly. While we completed some reforms to improve the lives of the workers, it might not have been enough. Critics of the reforms have started or stated they did not go even close to creating a lasting effect. Conditions continue to be unsafe and wages are not to support an acceptable living wage. Unfortunately, with our budget stretched thin, the reforms could have only gone so far. We'll have to hope that enough was done to keep the workers satisfied. I promise of more will, will be all we can do for now. Rumors are just rumors. Violence is just violence. A raid successful is just a raid successful. I will work on better research facilities now. Oh, please, let's do this. Why can't we do this? Why is it glitched? Ah. Maybe it's not glitched. Maybe it's just designed that way. Maybe she's born that way. We like Micah. Nice. I hope it's not slightly with that stuff. Oh, for Rook, you, you personally let him into bat. Okay, well, good job, dude. I like King Rook the second. He's a tough cookie. Lobster War ends. I should play Brazil again sometime. Increase production quotas? Yeah, yeah. That's good to do. We failed. We can do scavenger, but eh, we'll be okay. It'll be alright. A trader in a strange land. The capital of the principal deal was an odd one, seeing modern yet old fashioned at the same time. An interesting architecture painted the picture of a medieval European capital with an old and new Russian style. Uh, it was definitely not a place to visit, though Semislav, that he found it comforting. A trader from outside this strange kingdom was nothing he was used to back home. How was it changed from just a few years prior? What was once a dead economy with only poor farmers and laborers becoming more modern by the day? Perhaps the quirky king knew a lot more about leading the nation than anyone thought. It certainly seemed like it. And the people, ah, they were an interesting sight. No one dressed like them anywhere else in Russia, that was for sure, but it was how they, wasn't how they dressed that was more the most interesting thing. It was the actions they were even more colorful than the looks. Formal yet casual, joyful yet serious. The people really were just like the king. Azimoslav would be spending a few more days before he left for home. Perhaps he would stay even longer than he thought. It was a cheerful place, and the people certainly loved to buy what he sold. Perhaps I could bring my whole family for a visit. Because, why not? Seven divisions in this part of the country, this region, not bad. Quite strong, I'd say. Quite strong, and I love it. I love it. And this campaign shouldn't be too difficult. I say that now, and you find out it'll be much difficult later on, but, you know, whatever. Oh, do you know uh, a mod that I love? Way, way, way too much. All right, Tricky Dick? All right. Mr. Ebola. Mikhail. Even though I've played almost every single like, nation at least once here. He looks like such a ghoul. Harms looks like such a ghoul from Fallout. I feel bad for Carms, but not really. Not too much. The Royal Court, looking pretty good. On the Warpath, my friends. But, we've got to read about it, right? Please? On the Warpath, with the Prince and the Princess settled at least somewhat. King Rurik II has decided to look beyond the borders of Camarovo. Every king wants to expand the realm, and Rurik is no different. The traitors, warlords, and anarchists beyond the borders cannot be allowed to live any longer. It was time for Rurik to bring back stability to central Siberia. The military would have to be prepared for the invasion of our neighbors. They had to be defeated before they came for Camarovo itself. It may be a challenge, especially for the small military, but with Rook at the helm, leading his men into battle like any king should, we'll see victory in the end. To war! <sighs> Hail the season of war. Our preparations are over, and a new chapter of our nation is done. His Highness has made great efforts to make provisions for the coming struggle. Soldiers stand prepared on, on our borders, armed with months of training and guidance from his reverence and weapons our industry has manufactured. In due time, we'll take revenge against his deserter, General Andri. To the east, crush the anarchist rebellion beneath us and unify diplomatically or forcefully with the mystics to the south at long last. We shall conquer his grace's old mass and allow the remnant of the Central Siberian Republican Toms, the Rurik King Rurik, has been patiently waiting for this opportunity to unify Central Siberia. Hail the season of war, for it shall be bountiful. And it will be, no matter what. Why not? Raise the shield maidens. Hey, having our ambitions of regional unification clear, Princess Lydia has come to the king with an idea. The formation of a unit of shield maidens. These elite warrior women will be, Lydia argues, invaluable in the impeding battles that will face the kingdom. Furthermore, such a skill force will be considerably loyal. Two, King Rook and Princess Lydia. In fact, leaving such experienced and adapt soldiers to work on the home front would be nothing more than immense waste. His Highness is convinced that we shall start incorporating the shield maidens into a great army. We will certainly need them. Spring Rasputitsa. The signs have all arrived. 
The drip, drip, drip of water from the eaves of roofs have ceased, for there is no more snow for the morning sun to melt, exultation or exhaustion to no longer produce a cloud of mist. The forests have gone from silent to alive with the chirping of birds and the rustling of budding leaves. The ground is no longer blanketed in white, but covered with greens and browns and the myriad colors of wildflowers. Fields once grazed by the occasional elk now played home to herds of sheep and cattle. The farmers were no longer holed up in their steads, but were not plowing and tilling their fields. As the world came back to life, so did the royal army of Tsar Rurik. Parade grounds were once again swarming with men. Firing rangers crackled as they had months prior. Cadets ran through obstacle courses, driven hard by generals to make sure that their men's skills had not deteriorated over the winter. And in the command tents, generals unfurled maps and diagrams they had spent months planning. During the winter, they were patient, and during the spring, they will strike. Away go the winter coats, and out come the drums of war and reunion in Krasnoyarsk. Anticipation hangs over the ranks of soldiers waiting, preparing. Oh, look at that. Uh, for the beginning of her conquest, the king has no, no doubt on who shall feel her might first. His once trusted comrade, General Andri, who this betrayal came at the most burdensome time of the king's attempts to contain it and defeat the anarchist insurgency of the Siberian Black Army. All oh, the heart and humiliation his grace felt shall not go unpunished. And time come Robo and Krasnorsk will surely be reunited, and there we can turn our attention to our numerous other opponents. The start of our actualization has just begun, and King Rurik II sees this only as the beginning of our reunification of the entirety of our great... Empire. I thought these guys were supposed to be duking it out. They are. Oh, you're fighting. Oh, it's a three way war right now. Nice. That's good to see. Rejected. Oh, look, we're actually improving the poverty rate. Look at that. Raise the shield, maidens. The shield maidens. King Rurik looked over the courtyard from the front of his palace. Before him, over a thousand women stood at attention. These were just the first recruits of the newly reformed or formed shield maidens. The shield maidens were led, led by one Anna Kotsur, a Ukrainian nationalist who had been transported between various gulags before ending up in Kemerovo. She had been selected by Princess Lydia to lead the shield maidens, and both Anna and Lydia stood next to the King Rurik in front of the palace doors. Anna Kotsur gave a speech thanking King Rurik a second for the opportunity to lead these brave women into battle. A Russian had a notable Ukrainian accent, and the King Rurik admittedly didn't catch every word she said, nevertheless. Her speech resonated with her troops, who applauded as King Ruck appointed her officially to the rank of general after she concluded her speech. Princess Lydia gave a speech of her own. The shield maidens had originally been her idea, and she gave a passionate speech about how the bravest soldiers in the realm will now finally have their chance to display the bravery on the battlefield. Once she concluded, King Ruck stepped forward. He thanked the shield maidens for choosing to serve the king in the most honorable fashion. No longer would the realm deprive women of their chance to fight the enemies of the king upon the grand battlefield the rush had become. With that said, King Ruck concluded this speech. A call for a 21 gun salute, the last gun signaled the end of the ceremony, and a coat led the troops out the courtyard. Glory to the shield maidens. Mm, the trial of General Andri. Following a recent triumph victory over the Crest Norris, the little leader, General Andri, now stands before the mercy of King Rurik, uh, the man who abandoned him in his lows. Andri's great betrayal had affected Rurik greatly. The drinking, smoking, and humiliation, and the guilt. All these habits and feelings appear to have passed over that fateful evening of his transformation. But the betrayal has never left. Uh, and now that the king is finally reunited with his bitter rival, he will finally put Andri on trial for his treason. All that remains is to administer, admi administer a suitable punishment. One severe enough that no one will ever think again to forsake his majesty ever again. Where do you go in? Where do you scan for loot? 15% factory output is not enough. Extra factory output is not enough. Give more guns. Let's pop up to two. Ooh, a little bit of luck. Happy July. Another division. Yes, thank you. 15 combo is not bad. Not bad. And they do have anti-tank on them, huh? Go in, boys and girls, because we do literally have women here, too, so. We should do all right. Would you all like to hurry up and get over there? Good. Help them out. Get some more army XP as well. Good. Very good. Beautiful. Actually, do we have any planes? Doesn't look like it. Oh, we need the political part of the area, too. Ah, a boon to be sure. 
Beautiful. Oath of loyalty. Despite being on the losing side of the recent conflict, several officers that used to serve General Andre have arrived at His Majesty's court over the past few weeks. His Highness has made it clear that he's willing to show more mercy to them than he did with the treacherous general. As such, the Tsar has commanded the army to immediately set about integrating these new generals into our army. The sooner the better. After these talented new officers have been combined with their own, we will certainly be much more prepared for the inevitable conflicts of the future. Very nice. Loot? Yes. We love the loot. Nine divisions. Not enough. Do we still have a deficit? Oh, God, you bet we do. A trial. Ah, Nikolai Andreev was dragged in the King Rurik's throne room and forced to his knees before the king. He was bruised and bloody, and the once charismatic general now was quiet. His eyes were staring at some unknown point of interest on the floor. Andreev was a man who had deserted King Rurik for his lowest point. The smoking, drinking, humiliation, and the guilt all stemmed from Andreev's betrayal. Well, the king has since risen from his nadir. Andrew's betrayal still angered his majesty. Andrew was formally charged with a long list of crimes, and Andrew confessed to these crimes after some coercion from the royal guard. It was now time for King Rurik to determine Andrew's sentence, either exile or execution. Would Rurik be the Vladimir the Great, who slew his own brother for his treachery? Or would he set a more merciful example and let Andrew live on in foreign lands? Could Rurik, King Rurik forgive <clears throat> uh, this traitor so easily? Nikolai Andrew's fate rested in King Rurik's hands and King Rurik's hands alone. Expelled from the realm upon pain of death if he ever returns. Sentence to death. Well, we'll do this one, just because that seems like it would be a little more fitting for this one. Oh! Credit rating approved. Ah, yes. A king for Krasnoyarsk. Now the traitor's general, General Andreev, is dealt with, and his generals have been integrated, we should begin to work on bringing the rest of the Krasnoyarsk under the rule of the Tsar. Old administrators are to be replaced, new flags are to be being brought in, the image of General Andreev shall vanish from the streets of Krasnoyarsk. After we impose the Rurik's authority over his new subjects, our position in the region will be far stronger. The state will soon be ready to remove the remaining opponents of his great and the skulk around. It seems now that it's only a matter of time before his majesty will rule over all of our enemies. The oath of loyalty. Alexandra Semusenko couldn't help but be a little nervous as the royal guard had led her and several other former generals of Krasnoyarsk through the palace. While they all surrendered somewhat peacefully and pledged their allegiance to King Rurik, he still demanded they do in person. She wondered if the king continued to hold a grudge against him for siding with Andreev. Probably. The doors to the throne room will open, and there he sat, King Rurik II, formerly known as General Krylov, Nikolai Krylov, that is. Krasnoyarsk, generals, not before the king, who rose and grabbed a sword from some signatory. Um, he stood before uh, Semosenko, his face difficult to read. Alexandra Simosenko, if you wish to serve King Rurik, second king of the Rus, and improve your loyalty and humility, stated the king, evidently referring to the boot he presented before her face. <clears throat> It felt humiliating having to kiss a man's boot, but that was likely the point of this whole act, one final test of loyalty. Alexandra Samosenko, please rise your feet, stated King Rurik, and Alexandra Samosenko did as he commanded. He placed the sword upon her right shoulder, and then he left, and then the left withdrew the blade. General Alexandra Samosenko, you may now serve this kingdom with pride and valor. Uh, Samosenko was beckoned to the side of the throne room as another Krasnurov's general stepped forward, and the same procedure repeated. The whole ceremony had been quite tense, and she hadn't realized she had been holding her breath throughout the ceremony. She sighed, and uh, Kimrov was certainly a different beast compared to Krasnorsk. She just hoped she could adapt. The king welcomes your service. Sick Semper Tyrannus. Rurik II is not the king that they expected, but the king that was needed. Such is the opening of the king's speech in the great square of Krasnoyarsk. Rurik looks from face to face, sees the familiar look, closed off look of the eyes like bare down bare doors or barred doors, and every Russian face that turns to him. Rurik sees this, and speaks nonetheless. Andrei was, the, was of the military, sworn to defend the people of the land, Rurik says this solemnly. Going on in solemn conviction, yet the military turned on the people once the Germans bested them. The president general was a tyrant with no legitimacy, and no doubt did terrible things. The people listened with cautious eyes, and the bars seemed to lift somewhat, as the king assures them that they are in better hands now, that the king, Tsar, will bring peace and prosperity to Russia with all his people in harmony. While there are murmurs here and there that dissent, Rurik simply speaks with plain sincerity. The unlikely looking king on his dice. Speaking to the crowds gets much right, but much wrong, yet the sincerity bleeds through nonetheless. The people may in fact be in good hands. You have labored under a tyrant, says the king, and the people murmur at that. But we will feed and clothe you, and we will aid the needy. And the people's murmurs turn cautiously hopeful. Tyrants are a matter of perception. Also, Nova Sabiris actually declared war on us off-screen um, as I try to fix up our mistake, which I honestly can't remember now at the time of this recording, because this part of the video is being done on another day compared to the first half or first part, so my apologies. Also, I did the reason why we look so weak is because I made these guys 27 combo authority, and we're doing pretty darn well already. They don't have a lot of divisions, but, you know, they chose a good war with us, and I'm kind of okay with that. I'm actually really okay with that. Let's see what we can do about this. They're attacking us, which is fine. Um, we'll wait for these guys to do something else here. Um, overall, yeah, not bad, though. This must be fighting over a rubber. Yeah, they are. That sucks. 
Go to Bisque. Would be nice. And we want to hurry up and do this as fast as possible because you never know who else might attack us. But yeah, overall, this campaign so far, this video, not bad. Not bad. Now let's do that too. New additional equipment. Um, anything there we really care about? Not too much right here. Military coup in Thailand. Um, you guys are not moving in, which is kind of a mistake, I'd say. You guys should definitely move in. And you guys should probably go right here as well. If you possibly can. Winning there would be very nice. Um, losses, 1,000 versus 5,000. Iberian Council, pretty normal. Uh, get these guys in there, that'd be good. Then we can strike there next if we really wanted to. Uh, oh, now we finally won there, which is good. Finally, finally, finally. Oh! Nice. Good stuff. You know what, just, just, just keep them under wraps. How about there too? Now that's not good that we're losing there, but now we can win right here, too. We might as well help out. We might as well. Five to seven divisions. How much manpower do they have left? They have a lot of manpower. They have a one production unit, though. And Mr. Schmittler's gone. Goodbye, Mr. Schmittler. Um, I do want to do external investments, but we can wait to do that one. Let's keep doing parts of the Siberian plan. I want to do the 85 stuff, maybe. Gain goes down. 65. 19% factory output is... That's already very, 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 very good. Which I love, don't get me wrong, but still. If anything here, scavenger, fortress buster, no, not really. Just fine. Cool. Hurry up. Get into there. It's fine. Wow, we got a lot of manpower now. This is great. I don't want to just keep on attacking and attacking and attacking, but in all honesty, I really do. <laughs> in all honesty, I would love to just keep attacking, attacking, attacking. They might be able to win up there. We're going to win down there. Pretty nice overall. This was extraction. Oh, ah, it's lagging because the German Civil War is firing and the successor states, the warlords, are coming alive. And we have another cup of coffee here, too. Give us nice and warm. I see 1.5%. Honestly, I'd probably rather do this one. Nothing for loot, yep. Cool. Pretty good. Ah, uh, you should be able to beat them up. They're the only militia. Ah, and the world's falling apart now. As it probably should. As it probably should. Good, good, good. Honestly, you should be able to do okay now. And South Africa will, will fire soon, but that's alright with us. It yeah, keeps you guys busy. Don't even worry about it. Nice. If you take Nova Sabias, that might be it. Ooh, I still need to play Auslan. I've not played Auslan before. Ooh, I thought that we would be able to take that. That's fine. Help him out here. It's fine. Yes. Loot. We love the loot. Warsaw Uprising. Alright, Nova Sibiosk is being contested. You know, in all honesty, don't do not do that. There's no point to just waste manpower like that right now. Ooh, there goes my voice too. Oh boy. You guys should do this instead. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I guess we're going to. <clears throat> Fully surround them and kill them all off. Nice. And the game lags, but that's pretty normal. They only have militia there. No, that's a mistake. That's a giant mistake. Oh, and there goes those people too. Goodbye. That's nice. Hey, to the skies, my friends, to the skies. We got them. Now either we defeat Tomsk, these guys, or these guys next. Because a lot of these auto completed over here, so if you want to read about this, we'll put this ahead as well as the power of the myth and the revolt. I want to strike down the revenant or the revolt first. Honestly, these guys are busy. The longer they're busy with these guys, the better. So we probably want to go to war with these guys first, even though these guys are going to be a pain in the butt to kill off, even though they have no manpower. Strike down the remnant. The king's attention now has been turned to the People's Revolutionary Council and the relic of the Red Army that remained under its control. In order to obtain control of all of Central Siberia, it is crucial that we take out the PRC. Their army has proven to be formidable and poses a great threat to our survival. The troops a season from their war with the Mengjiang are unlikely to be a walk walkover. Nevertheless, our disciplined and devoted men stand ready to undertake one of the greatest challenges the kingdom has faced so far. Power is getting better here. What else can we do? Nothing else here, which kind of sucks, but whatever. And do that one too, but we must spend political power first doing this. 
Hopefully these guys hold on for a while. <coughs> Still have a deficit. Kind of sucks. Oh well. Whatever. Not good, and we're that that much strength still. A little bit of lag because Muscovine exploded. Yay! These guys aren't super well. Sp yeah, they're not going to be that strong. Hopefully, the love of God, hope they're not that strong. Hold on, Siberian Black Army. We don't really care for you very much, but still. Uh, is the motorized? I don't see him on the front line. What the heck? Oh my goodness, taking you so long to move, eh? Oh, they're pushing back, which is good. Go ahead and hop them out here. Nice. 6,000, wow. So, maybe Black Army's doing quite a good amount of damage to him already. It is going to take some time to push through here because. It sucks fighting through there. It just sucks. Uh, is there any place we're not doing uh, industrial expertise? That'd be good to do. Hey, look at that! Another division. Yes. Wow, they are they are fighting till they die, which is fine with me. I'm totally okay with that. Yeah, uh, just more I see gain. It's fine to do. More construction speed, not bad. Eight, almost twenty percent is that's ridiculous. It's so good. Don't get me wrong, but that's ridiculous. Ridiculously good. Ooh, do we have anything else here? Extra investments would be good to do as well. Um, if you want to help out here too, that'd be good. Supply wise, it's going to be god awful fighting through here. But yeah, I, I don't think you can manage it. I can barely manage it. Oh, crap, that's not good. So if you want about that, please go right ahead. As well as this one, as well as this one, and the revolt. So. So I might need to do some funky stuff here because Thomas might be going to war with us very soon. Crap. <clears throat> do we lose a division? Well, we have not forced the attack yet, so... I mean, any damage we do, they can't repair themselves with, so... They're out of guns as well, which is good. Force it. The more damage you do now, the less they have later. The raffles are nice. Um, we're not. I'm not going to change it out yet, just because we need more guns, anyways. So. Anything else here? No. Oh crap! Doing that's a bad idea. Okay, that's, that's actually okay with us. Good. You better start shifting your divisions north. You're going to completely lose everything. Even though you kind of already are, but whatever. God, fighting this part of the world, Russia is god awful. We literally don't even have supply base. The only supply base is up there and down here. Ugh. My god, does this suck. Seriously. Oh, the nurse. Anastasia Abdulova was a busy woman. Papers needed filing. <clears throat> Patients needed checking on, and doctors needed assistance. Uh, she had no time for the crowd of important looking politicians currently. Flood in the hallway, inhibiting the function of the otherwise perfectly efficient hospital, which had been completed and opened scarcely a week ago. Excuse me, she stated, shuffling through the dense crouch, elbowing several nobles. They glanced at her with mild annoyance and continued their conversations, remaining stuck in place. Excuse me, she shouted, all the eyes turned towards her, why with surprise. They slowly shuffled to the sides of the hall and cleared a path for her. Thank you, she huffed, before beginning a brisk walk. A hand reached out through the mass of expensive clothing and haze of perfume. A grasp Anastasia arm, holding her firm. Anastasia, is that you? Princess Lydia's head attached to the body attached to the hand which gripped the nurse's arm poked out. Her face was uncharacteristically astonished and friendly. What, what are you doing here? 
Lydia An Anastasia stuttered. I mean princess, she quickly corrected. She curtsied and assumed a respectful stance with her hands folded and head bowed. I'm a nurse at this hospital. P princess, please forgive me for my impoliteness. I mean no offense. Uh-huh. Uh, Lydia looked at her hand, still stuck to Anastasia's arm. She let go and awkwardly returned her arm to her side. I didn't expect you to see her. How are you? How's Lexi? I'm doing well. Lexi died two years ago, but her daughter, uh, Anastasia, blessed her embarrassment. embarrassment. Lydia has grown up to be a strong little girl. That's good to hear, Anastasia. Lydia's face grew serious. It's been good to see you. She gestured around at the hospital. Sometimes I forget where I came from. It's been good to see you as well, Princess. Anastasia curtsied again and continued on her way. Lydia's gaze followed her in the future that could have been. A warrior with the heart of a healer. Let's do this one. That'll be good. Oh, hello. Yeah, don't worry about that. We've got to go this way. Go there. Maybe right there. That, that'll cut them all off from the south. And cut off their supplies as well, because, my god. I hate finding this area. It's probably one of the worst things that you do in TNL. You know. Absolute worst things. Come on. How weak are you guys that you can't help fight these guys at all? Four, you have four to seven divisions? How do these guys have more divisions than you all? Oh, we're going to be here a while. We could brute force it if we really wanted to, but... Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> of course, we'll need this tile and this tile to get down here, too. So, you know what? We'll also work on this way. Work on whatever way we can, really. This makes it so god awful and boring. Why? Why? Oh, you know what? I might just finish this war off screen just because this is taking so long and it's very, very, very boring. And now, everyone. We struggled so much, but then Tom's got all the territory, which is completely BS. Complete utter BS, which is stupid. But because they're so weak, we should be able to take them out hopefully relatively easily, but I hate sometimes how this is set up that we don't get anything out of the wars. Yeah, I'll be honest, like if we have to cheat, we'll have to cheat because this is crap. But the King's Speech. A monarch put on airs in his castle and play the war with his miniatures, but if he's unable to leave the men on the battlefield, he's merely a mascot with delusions of grandeur. His subjects rely on his strength and wisdom for guidance in trying times, and nowhere are times more than the shattered statelets of Russia. In short, the king must leave. His majesty Rurik II is already preparing a speech in order to bolster the flagging spirits of our soldiers. No one imbibes the values of strength, wisdom, and bravery more than he does, and with their long months seeing only the worst of humanity, they would do well seeing and hearing the best. The king's speech. Tsar Rurik strode across the stage with all the finesse and authority his position commanded. With his fur-lying cloak <clears throat> fluttering in the breeze, the microphone was set up and switched on, and the speakers scattered across the parade ground were silent, save for the occasional faint wishing as the wind blew over it. Turning to face the assembled soldiers, he did not wait before launching into his speech. Subjects, loyal men, fellow Russians, his voice boomed over the speakers. The time for which you have trained is upon you. Your homeland lies sundered, divided between a hundred bandit princes. They desecrate the corpse of Mother Russia, they cheer as they rape her body, or smile as they bathe in her blood, and laugh as they feast upon her children. And they dare do it while you watch. Well, watch we will not. The soldiers were listening intently to Rurik's every word, a thousand eyes boring into him. We, you, shall not stand by. You shall take up the sword once held by your forefathers. You shall strike the foe before you as we struck the Tartar, Mongol, and the Cossack, and the German once before. You shall pride those who defile the motherland out of their lairs and cast them into the fire. And there shall come a day, God willing, when your valor and sacrifice unite Mother Russia once more. Ura. The soldiers threw their fists in the air, mimicking their Tsar's cry, Ura, Ura, repeated. The Tsar, the, not Tsar, the Russian bear at last leaves its den. The King's Railway. Transportation infrastructure makes up the veins and arteries of the nation, and when they are severed, all it can do is bleed to death. His distant reaches, unable to be sustained. Even the victors of conflict <clears throat> are dangerous to coming to this sort of collapse if they do not rapidly rebuild. His Majesty, the ones who channel all of the creative force of the people, must respond to this waiting crisis. Streets and railroads will be restored and more relieving. The great infrastructure projects of the old Tsars, his lands will be prosperous and connected more firmly than ever. We can build the world, of, the world for ourselves as long as he demands it. Royal Governance. Our territory of the stage is great, and King Rurik II, for all his uh, grace, is but one man. The extent of his realm is too great to be supervised entirely from the seat in Komarovo. The time has come to delegate helpers, the eyes and ears of his majesty in the newly conquered lands. 
The establishment of royal governors will vastly streamline the process of ruling. Naturally, the officer class are the best candidates for these new positions. They fought to add them into the kingdom, they know the land, they have respect to the people and the soldiers. For their efforts, they can expect handsome rewards and honors of royalty and the forms of official titles. As we have just now gone to war because these guys are pieces of doo doo. And if we have to cheat, like I said, so be it. Because these guys cheated against us. They got the super easy, easy time. Why are you at the bottom here, you stupid idiots? Um, to just take these guys out. Like, they just literally just walked in. That's all they did. That's literally all they did. So. Which is complete crap to us. That's so stupid. How are we losing? Oh my god, I hate this war already. This is one of the worst things we'll have to do. <clears throat> Just go around here, you stupid idiots. My god. So incredibly stupid and frustrating. TNO can just be really a piece of work sometimes. Whether it's lag or just poorly made things. Oh my goodness, I hate it sometimes. I love the mod, but sometimes I just really hate it. Oh my god. Okay, we sh they should be suffering extreme attrition down here. We were suffering so much attrition, it's not even funny. Railway, World Governance. Right there. You want to cut off supplies? It'll be it. We'll cut off your lives. Let's go to Tomsk. That's just nice. It's not enough to take them out, unfortunately, but. If only. If only. Oh my god, stop lagging so hard. Come on, you know. I literally have nothing else in the background processing. Or doing anything, really. Turn to the king. Well, if you don't know about this, please go right ahead. Silence the hawks. If you don't know about that, please go right ahead. The will of the people. Um, well, technically, I don't know about auto bypassing. The Silviki have been crushed, or long suffering people owe their newfound freedom to King Rurik. His Majesty does not wish to let this goodwill to go to waste, and already plans to begin a large scale propaganda campaign in the new territories, increase support, and remind the people of Nova Sobirsk that the days of the chafing under the corruption of oligarchs are over. The Liberator will be made to see that His Majesty fights with the best interests of mind, and hope that this message will resonate all throughout Siberia. The corrupted and unworthy will not be saved so long as the arms of King Rurik II are on the march. Move faster, move faster, move faster. God dang it, come on. Oh, they want Konsky? Yeah, there you go. See what you can do there. Beat him up. Yeah, we'll have to cheat for this, maybe. If we have to, so be it. You know, I don't want to deal with this type of garbage. Because all this territory should have been ours. It literally should have been ours. It makes no sense why it's not ours. We fought and bled for this, and yet we don't get any part of this? Come on. I'm not gonna tolerate cheaters. I, like, if AI wants to cheat, so be it. Then we get to cheat. It just makes sense, right? It only makes sense to me. Come on, go in. Come on. And they're so spread out, you can't even do anything about it. Boy, I'm early. We need him. Just to uphold the line. You should be suffering way more attrition than this. You should be suffering way, 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 way more attrition. There we go. Uh, and then the breadbasket of Siberia. The plains of Barno, some of the most fertile grounds in all of Siberia, have long existed as the sinews of a critically important agricultural hub. With these areas falling under the king's own protection, we can begin to utilize them for our own benefit. Not only can we make improvements for of our own to increase output, but we could also examine the layout of the vast farmlands to see if we can, can apply them in agricultural regions throughout the entire realm. With well, a little hard work, we'll be able to ensure that at least, at last, the people of His Majesty's realm will no longer go hungry, and that our soldiers can bite on a full stomach for once. These advantages alone will place our young principality head and shoulders above the rest of the warlord sacreds. One thing about this focus I don't like how, I mean, it's okay how it's organized. You should be able to go to war with anyone you want. You really should be able to. I think that'd be a lot more, that'd be better, because why do we have to go to war in a certain order? I don't like that idea. If you can't win, you're going to die. So, that's all there is to it. Uh, same thing with you over here. You know what? It's not even worth trying to do in supplement. You're going to get killed along the way. Um, engineer, sure, why not? Yeah, our... Oh my god, I hate this so much. They got such an easy time. Um, no, go there. Both of you go there. You should be able to beat up, uh, at least Tomsk. You can't beat up anything, can you? 27 combo with cannot beat up anything. Come on. It's probably because they have planes. Yeah. They have five. We have none. Go.
Good, get down there. No one gives a crap about Free France. Let's be real here. Oh my god, stop lagging. I'm gonna do this off screen as well, because I, I don't like this war. I hate this war. It's so bad. So if you take out to Kamsk, or Tomsk and Konsk, what is left for their capital? That's my question. Alright, so there we go. That, 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 Bratsk. All we need is Bratsk. You're probably going to get it circled, though. Do that. Get these guys in place, and that should be enough to kill them off, right? That's good so far. Um, you guys go there. Go there. If you can. I'd love to use the motorized, but sometimes they're just way too slow. You can't even use them. Uh, there you go, too. Getting pinged on both sides, which sucks. You did take out both divisions, which is very good, actually. So, finally, it's something good. Uh, right there. Plus the junction sucks. Whatever. Go in. Go in here. No of trials. As the prosecution listed off a very exhaustive list of various ways, he and other several uh, Slaviks have violated Russia's most sacred traditions. <clears throat> Alexander Pokrushkin couldn't help but feel as though he had traveled several hundred years back in time. The judge, as well as the rest of the prosecution, were all dressed as though they were noblemen of the Kievan Rus. And they spoke in a form of Russian that was sounded rather antiquated to him, and it felt as if there was some kind of reactment from a long past trial from deep within Russia's medieval history. Pokrushkin felt the scene was so surreal that it could have been a chance. It was all just an incredibly vivid dream. Unfortunately for this captive flying ace turned statesman, this is no illusion. Alexander Pokrushkin, you are in charge with countless infractions against the honor and dignity of the Rus. How do you plead? The Siberian Falcon wrote, smiled wryly. If you are saying I'm guilty of attempting to trounce your little silly little renaissance fair here, then I suppose you're right. Just get me out of here so I don't have to listen to this farcical nonsense any longer. I would advise you to watch your tongues and your very carefully, Snake, before you find your contempt of court. We hereby find you guilty of all charges and sentence you to exile from the motherland. 20 years of prison. 20 years of prison. That's a Sobiesk. Ooh. Well, they know that is a core, which is good. And Nova Sobiesk, I'm talking about. But still. Good. Go in. Kill this division off. There we go. That's good. And we lost 11,000. We cut off 36,000, which is not bad. That's pretty decent. Overall. Mm, yeah, strong enough to take him out. Yep. Mm. Should be able to win that pretty easily, honestly. Run. Actually, did they core this yet? They've not. So fighting down here is kind of a waste. A little bit is ish. Come back up here. Yeah, come back up here. Be fine. Go in if you can. I guess for now, maybe try it. Oh god, dang it! You ding dongs. No, you fight together. You fight as one, not separately. You idiots. Oh my god! Come on. On the civil floor, the great conquest of Kokrishkin's uh, fifth and Nova Sibirsk has brought a good deal of resources to the kingdom. But with more wealth comes more problems. No better. Example is that of the case of Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia, who occupied the latest session of the civil war with an hours long debate on, who, on how the newly annexed factories of Nova Sibirsk should be integrated into the royal economy. As team members of the civil war, I highly recommend that you reject my dear sister's proposal on accounts that her actions are killing the loyal working men of Russia. I. They didn't even want to wait for Yuri to finish her sentence. I call upon the civil war to reject my brother's approval or uh, proposal. <clears throat> For following it will kill our nation. We cannot afford to tap our industry with red tape when we are surrounded by the war. Better the men in factories be a few kopecks short for a few years than for them to be slaves to bands for the rest of their lives. That line really set Yuri off. A few kopecks? How dare you suggest it's a minor? That minor. My programs will save lives while yours. As the siblings shouted at each other, the assemblymen on the civil war, at least those who could be bothered to stay awake, quietly judged them and weighed their options at last. The Tsar's thoroughly exhausted children returned to their seats and voted began. It was narrow, but the Sabor ultimately swung in favor of Prince Yuri. Well, status quo. I like this one more, honestly, but we'll go with Yuri. Straight Yuri, this campaign. It's just straight Yuri. Come on, get Bratz. No, you. Oh my God! Come on, you idiot. Oh my God! Why does why is AI so stupid? It's not even TNR's fault. It's paradox. Like why? Why are they so stupid? How could you not win here? What the heck? You should easily be able to win here. Force the attack. Win for the love of God. Come on. So stupid. So stupid, man. Oh my god, we actually did it. Wait, what? We lost it. 
apologize for my raging, but return to the king. Not long ago, Central Siberia was completely consolidated under the Central Siberian Republic, a state too weak to fend off its dissolution. The remnants of this regime remain in power up north. Sitting in the city of Tom Square, cut off from the industry, military, and broader masses, feuding cliques of intellectuals wage petty feuds over ideology while the leader, people, leader, or people suffer for lack of leadership. Following the death of the CSR, his weakness cannot come until His Majesty marches his forces through the capital of his successor statelet. For the sake of strength, discipline, and national development, these fools must be reminded of their place by force, ideally before they harm anyone else with their nonsense. Yay. That's just for here. Uh, ooh, here. The, oh, Irkutsk won. That's not good. We're still fighting, though. So, actually, how strong is Irkutsk? We have a lot of divisions, a lot of manpower. We don't have a lot, so let's not raid them, probably. Free aviators? Svedvalsk. Do we actually beat up Svedvalsk? Eh, yeah, maybe. We try. <clears throat> uh, lessons from Novosibirsk. Or Novgorod, I mean. Uh, yeah, definitely not. This one, if you're going to this one, please go ahead. But, lessons from Novgorod. Novgorod. His Majesty the King has decided in all his wisdom that the best choice to govern the newly acquired territories of Tomsk is his prince, prince son, Yuri. The prince already has plans for how to best govern the new lands, and they come with Yuri's usual flavor of idealistic uh, po uh, populism. Looking back to the ancient Republic of Novgorod for inspiration, Prince hopes to create an administration where all will be able to have their voices heard in public assemblies, while also looking to keep the vibrant cultural legacy of the previous administration alive. With luck, Prince Yuri's plan will ensure that the people of the new region remain loyal to the new king. Now we could keep doing this stuff, but... Mm, okay, why not? Last one we'll do. Papadar, huh? District consolidation. With the central Siberia firmly within the grasp of King Rook and his armies, he has now a tremendously powerful base to continue the reunification of Russia. This region has long been renowned for its extensive industrial centers, and it was at one time the beating heart of the Russia's once mighty industry. Now that we are there within our hands, we can begin a large scale effort to refurbish and modernize the factories to get most out of the potential output. Many of the factories are now quite old by modern standards, and bringing them up to speed should be our top priority. Once we establish the CS, uh, as the industrial heartland it once was. Our realm will be the envy of our neighbors, and we'll be able to produce armaments and munitions like never before to ensure our soldiers are some of the most welcomed in all of Russia. Nice. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, they're very well equipped and trained, so. Wow. 286 days. Jesus Christ, that's so bad. Scam for loot? Eh, we could probably do it too. Supplies are pretty bad around here, though. How strong are these guys? A lot of manpower. Uh, they probably got quite a bit of stuff here. Whatever. The Grand Prince of Holte, Siberia. Victory! King Rurik II and his valiant troops have accomplished what was thought to be impossible, and Central Siberia has been united under the royal banner. Our realm is no longer a minuscule state that barely able to keep the wilderness outside Kemerovo under control, but a proper and established government ready to take our cause to the glorious new heights. Therefore, it's no longer appropriate to call ourselves a principal to Kemerovo when the king now rules over so much more. The king has laid forth plans to reform the state into a new entity, the Grand Principality of Siberia. Creating this new principality will solidify our stance as the one legitimate, legitimate authority in the long divided lands of Siberia, and triumphantly proclaims to the world that Russia is finally on the road to reunification. The patron of Tomsk. Uh, let's probably build a uh, supply base here and railroads. There we go. That'll help out. Um, I'm not sure if we can actually do anything against these guys, so let's save first. <clears throat> That'll be good. And then what? The patron of Tomsk, Prince Yuri of Kemerovo, was assigned the title of governor of Tomsk, and he quickly implemented his style of rule over the city. Yuri ruled with an even hand, opening up the city's administration to all members of society, as long as they were qualified to do so. Prince Yuri also attempted to integrate as much of the former Tomsk police force as was possible, so that citizens of Tomsk could trust those patrol in the streets. Above all else, Prince Yuri wished to embrace the cultural riches of Tomsk. Tomsk had long attracted artists and visionaries from across Russia, an artistic safe haven amongst a sea of violence and repression. Prince Yuri continued to this tradition, sponsoring many artists and musicians and hosting numerous exhibitions for Tomsk art, uh, art scene. With Tomsk having had a strong democratic tradition ever since the Central Siberia, Central Republic, Central Siberian Republic of old, Republican sentiment naturally runs high in the city. In order to combat this, Prince Yuri created some elected positions within his Tom's government. Combined with additional sponsoring and funding of pro rookid artists and politicians, Prince Yuri attempted to sideline Republican sentiment through peaceful means primarily, only using violence as a last resort. Long live Prince Yuri. Good. Two cups of tea. Welcome, Matvi Kuz Kuzmich. Sit, sit, the rook opened the door and let Matvi Shapshinikov into his office. Fate had taken them in different directions, one from the military in Tomsk, one to the throne in Kemerovo. But politics and warfare cannot wear down the bonds of an old friendship. Well, I thank you, your majesty, replied Shapshinikov, clearly, uncomfort clearly uncomfortable with the honorific. <clears throat> 
Why, thank you. Uh, a laugh. Nonsense, must be. For you, I am still Nikolai Ivanovich. You walked over to the Semovar on the end table and grabbed a teapot atop it, filling two cups and adding cubes of precious pre-war sugar. The following hours were filled with laughter while reminiscing about old escapades, tears shed from old friends long gone, and sobering silence as they realized they had once ordered thousands of their men to fight the others. At least, Shapshnikov said as he sipped the last of his tea, there will be no more bloodshed between our men. You have brought peace to this region, Nikolai Ivanovich. Rook sighed, aye, but not elsewhere. There will be more battles, and blood and death shall be left in the wake, such as the price of reforging your homeland. Russia is desperate, Matvey Kuzmich, and her people need something, someone in whom they can place their trust, he smiled wryly at his old friend. And who better to follow than the old ghost of old Rurik, given life once again? The last of the tea grew cold, and Rurik dumped the dregs from his cup into the fireplace as he stood up. So ends our conversation. It was good to talk to you, Matvey Kuzmich. Likewise, your majesty. Ah, uh, still the deficit, but eventually we'll clear that out and reduce how big our armies are just because we want to reunify Russia. Form the great principality of Central Siberia. Apologize for any sort of rage earlier or anything like that. Oh, actually, if we really wanted to, we could do uh, external investments, but we need to keep our PP. Yes. Actually, this last one did what? Increase the growth, a better industrial expertise, and equipment. Slowly, of course. The Grand Principality of Siberia, we get more stability, which is great. It will be maxed out. A little more political power. Decrease coring time and united under the crown. will be next. Awesome. Since here, you might as well try to get slightly more army XP. Um, he's really somewhat well balanced. Not bad. One here. Of course, with this group, uh, I'm going to take this off. I'm going to really kill off what we have here. So, you guys do this. That's fine. Because I don't want to have that much cost for money. Cool. Let me do that too. There you go. Engineers, nice. 1964, not bad. Uh, industry stuff. Let's really start beelining through industry. And naval stuff, not sure why we have so much naval XP, but that's okay with me. 0.18, barely any growth, just because we're trying to course so much here, which is fine. <clears throat> totally, 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 totally fine. Not bad. Very nice. Two years left, which will help us out quite a bit. Irkutsk, everyone's still killing each other. Komi's doing okay-ish, Samar's doing okay-ish. Everyone's doing okay-ish, Vyatka, of course. Well, now let's read about the same. The Grand Principal of the Soviet has now been united under King Rurik II, may, long may he reign, formerly known as Major General Nikolai Krylov, but King Rurik had come to an understanding his destiny and overcome his failures. The Siberian Black Army had been subjugated to the anarchist experiment of failure. The traitor General Nikolai Andreev has been brought to justice and Krasnoyarsk reintegrated. No Soviet led by Paul Krishkin. The Siberian Falcon now served King Rurik in his conquest with his vast industry, population, and resources. The People's Revolutionary Council has been defeated and the socialist cause is taking yet another blow. Tomsk, the last remnants of the Central Siberian Republic, now a loyal subject under the king. It better be loyal. <clears throat> with all such a Siberia now under, united under the King of Rus, King Rurik is now a powerful contender for uniting all of Russia. As unlikely as it may have seemed once upon a time, King Rurik's eccentric persona, beloved by the common people, is now well known across both Russia and even the international community. Who knows what the future holds for this glorious Rome now that it may very well hold the fate of all Russia in its hands. Of course, King Rurik's dreams are not yet achieved. And other, still, other containers still threaten his majesty and his Rome from both beyond the east and west. The Grand Principality of Central Siberia is not yet safe. Many specters have called King Rurik the second mad, and laughed at his dreams of uniting Russia, but now King Rurik shall be the one laughing now, laughing from his grand and mighty throne. Long live the king, long live Russia. So now we can form it, and we're pretty much done with the Siberian plan. Thank you. What a madman. And a kingdom of contradictions, once so long ago. Russia was a land of valor and loyalty, but with the ages came decadence, and the people forgot their roots. Fascism, communism, democracy, it's all the same. Wolves, who would lure the Russian to their lair. The nation's survival lies at the source, a mighty kingdom just led by king. Led by just king. Tsar Rurik II, and in his eternal mass, he shall waste no time here in healing the wounds of Russia, starting in Siberia itself. But Rurik II is understanding of the people's needs. He will not embrace decadence, but take the best of all worlds. He helps the workers, not because of revolution, but because out of benevolence. Maintain the old ways, but not corrupt them like the fascists. Give the people justice without compromising the rule of the Tsar. Some may find the style of rule erratic, irrational even, but they are blind to the future, which is the past, ignorant of a tradition, which is perpetual. Hey all, Tsar Rurik II, monarch of all of us, shield of Siberia, king of kings, until we have some sort of revolt. God dang, I don't want to revolt. But it'll happen no matter what. Alright, so poverty relief will increase better our poverty for now. We want to do this one as well. Agriculture actually does the exact same thing. This gives you two effects though, which is even better than this one. Because, oh, actually this gives you more growth though. But it gives you improved agriculture at a normal rate, as well as poverty at a normal rate, which is exceptionally awesome. Just, just really, really good. Like, holy crap. Nice. Uh, we want to do with the uh, workers' revolt, probably eventually too. Monumental workers, new aristocracy. 
In these turbulent times, men elected to follow those with the biggest purse and gun. A good subject is hard to find, but harder to maintain. The principality of Siberia is full of opportunists and men of low morals, but they are fired, and the Tsar's advisors, generals, and local leaders shall be rewarded for their loyalty with landed titles. Useful individuals of poor character will be given honorary, empty titles, and eventually marginalized until devoted men come along. Commanders will be given five times in the form of villages and camps so they can muster custom forces for upcoming campaigns. Mayors and advisors shall receive large settlements to foster economic growth and development. Um, if you want to read about the revival of Norse, please go right ahead, but... Naturally, there will be those who decry the nobility as corrupt and archaic. What they do not understand, however, is that aristocracy organizes the population in a unique way. While the rest of Rus suffers from a lack of hierarchy, we'll be planting the seeds of a better tomorrow. Yay. Reconnect the roads, yes please. Very, very important to reconnect the roads. Actually, how much worker discontent do we actually have? Two wolves. It's not bad. Get more political power. Revolutionary king. New Sabor. Kuznets Basin. Legacy of plan is very good. Ah. There we go. If you wonder about this, please go ahead. Harrowing. Oh boy. I'm not going to touch that yet. Yeah, I don't want to read about that stuff. So. Reading then you can be closed out. This one can be closed until like 1969. Most influential advisor is still the prince. Oh, 0.63 is not good. Kingdom of Contradictions. The Family Feud! Nice. And U.S. aristocracy affairs of the realm. More stability for the bar is always good to get, though. Beautiful. Alright, poverty relief. Yes. Uh, actually, let's do that one first. We'll do more poverty relief next. Uh, as you can see, Father, our domain now searches from Tatarsk to, in the west to Brotsk in the east for the first time. Uh, in several weeks, reports have reported minimal resistance to our. Boris Krylov trailed off as he looked into his father. The king looked deeply troubled, his eyes, distant and cold, Rurik the second seemed to care little about the subject at hand. It was obvious his mind was focused on something darker. Father, what troubles you now? <clears throat> You've been so quiet today. King Rurik the second's eyes snapped to his son. It's your siblings, Boris. What the heck am I supposed to do with them? Their disputes grow more venomous and destructive by the day, and I cannot bear to watch it any longer. Boris walked away from the map he had been presenting his side as he took a seat next to his father. The old king sounded utterly defeated. I wish I could tell you, you know I was never one for politics, father. Politics? You think this is about politics? You and Lydia, my own flesh and blood, have become enemies. And I've done so little to stop them. What kind of father stands by while his children go to war? Rurik the second sounded as though he was on the verge of tears. Boris put a reassuring hand on his father's shoulder. You've done what you could, father. As much as it pains us to see them fight, this may be the only way they can settle their differences. The king's eyes grew distant once more. Perhaps you're right, Boris. It's just that they used to be so close. Trouble on the horizon. A new capital? Uh, the capital of the nation is also its heart, just like the old Moscow connected all of Russia. Kemerovo is beginning to branch out of its infrastructure, and soon all roads may lead to it. However, the Zemsky Sabor has been consolidating, relocating of the capital to a more practical location such as Novosibirsk. A central location could alleviate further logistical issues, as well as inspire the people after all. Kemerovo was forced to be the seat of the Tsar because of the necessity, but now we can afford the luxury of choice. And if you want to read about the eye wall, please go right ahead. I don't let him do it already, which is fine. They just tell us where they're going to strike, so... There you go. Nice. And actually, since we're here, I don't want to see this at all. There we go. Uh, we still have a depth, which sucks, but we're going to change our divisions up very soon anyway, so... Not super worried about that. Take it off. Take it, take it, take it off. When in doubt, take it off. Cause are uprising. Don't worry about that. Please go right ahead. Can you all just calm down? The Revolt of Tomsk. Um... The city of intellectuals turns into the city of revolutionaries. Well, that's nice. Go in. Immediately just kill them all off if you can, please. Thank you. Ah, oh, they're spread all, all across the place here, too. I forgot about that. New capital? Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, which one of these does poverty as well? Uh, this is not bad. This is actually really good to do as well. Construction worker training. I thought there was another one that did poverty. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, this one's good to do for a bonus for industry. There we go. Uh, monuments were victories. When the Tsar so ruled Russia, they erected many memorials to celebrate great feats. They, the, these statutes of warriors, emperors, thinkers, and workers they ensure the eternity of nations. However, with the coming of the treacherous Hun and the Japanese, all monuments have been lost, demolished, and desecrated. <clears throat> Fortunately, there's no shortage of epics in Siberia. Recent tales of courage in the Tsar's might. Plans are already being laid. Statues of Rurik II will observe the kingdom from mountaintops. Uh, city centers will be decorated with shrines of the braves of the king's guard. Every fractal shall have a monument to inspire its workers. Centuries later, when Russia climbed out of the grave, our children look back and marvel at the victories we've won here today. A toast. Rurik's banquet. As hall filled with food and laughter as he and his new aristocrats celebrate their victory or the traitors in the implementation of a better Siberia. Hey, Rurik, pass the butter, will you? Well, one rather large man began to drink his fourth glass of vodka. 
Rurik smiled and reached for the butter when he was interrupted by the old aristocrat. Sergei, you never talk to your Tsar like that. Where are your manners? That's quite fine, Nikolai. I quite enjoy the pleasantries rather than anything more formal, responded Rurik. As you say, Tsar Rurik II. By the grace of God, the conqueror and almighty, I humble in your presence, said the old aristocrat, now bowing. Rurik paused, but was distracted by another young aristocrat. You're as good as putting on a banquet as you are ruling the kingdom, he said. You even got your children to stop arguing. Well, I always know when it's a good time to celebrate, and so do my children, Rurik replied. He knew he would be facing more challenges soon, but it was about time to enjoy the pleasant atmosphere of Kemerovo himself. Without him, none of this would exist after all. Nice to see something without an incident. There you go. Probably a bad idea, but we're gonna convert all these guys in this division so we can actually save some money now. Yay! Money! So now you're gonna be stuck at one. Actually, you know what? Just deploy you. That's fine. I'll try to drink uh, two of these guys at a time, which will be fine. Convert yourself to this. Nice. Should be making quite a bit more money now. After changing. Oh, look at that. Nice. Because we're maxed out on this. And then with, um, do we at least go up? We don't even go up already? What is that? That doesn't make any sense. What? What? Ha, huh, why? And equipment should go up quite a bit soon, too. New capital. Of course, this one, too. Affairs of the realm. With well, this position finally secure, the principality must look inwards. Laws need to be expanded to fit a large population. The bureaucrats recruited to administer the new provinces. And officers promoted to protect the borders. The Tsar Rurik himself will oversee the creation of the new legislation and place the royal seal upon the most pragmatic proposals. The aristocracy will be given permission to draft laws unique to their own fiefs, but ultimately everyone must answer to the Zemsky Savoir. Lastly, an important issue needs to be considered. Siberia is a large and unforgiving place, so the infrastructure is key to reclaim the rest of the Rus. Local enterprise will be subsidized to promote the development of roads and communication workers or, commu or communication networks. And the key Kingdom is to succeed. It will need to be able to draw upon the land and ensure that its laws are heard by all. A new capital? The situation has changed dramatically from the grim hours we had endured several hours or years ago. With the victory of His Majesty's armed forces and the expansion of the realm's borders to encompass the entire central Siberian region, a question has been raised of where exactly the royal court shall be located. Kamrovo was never intended to be the permanent center of royal authority and was mostly chosen simply because it was the only noteworthy settlement available to us. Now that the region has been unified, we now have a loop, few new locations that can potentially be more suitable as the administrative center of the realm. Novo Siberia is the most obvious choice, being the largest most populous city in all of Siberia. On top of being a vital industrial center, the city beneath benefits from well-developed infrastructure and a strong agricultural base. Alternatively, we can move the court to the city of Krasnoyarsk, formally controlled by the Nikolai Andreev and his mutineers. Well, not necessarily as populous as Novo Siberia, Krasnoyarsk is still quite large by Siberian standards, and most importantly of all, it's home to a critical junction of the Trans-Siberian Railway. This fact alone makes the city an appealing choice indeed. Of course, we could always just decide to stay in Kemerovo. Of all of the potential choices, Kemerovo is most certainly centrally located, and benefits from having developed into a stronghold of royal authority for many years. Of course, there is also the sentimental value. Kemerovo was where Akina was proclaimed in the first place. After all, no Sibirsk, Krasnoyarsk. I like this extra stability. Kemerovo is too important to abandon, but if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue with improving uh, Russia and uh, having a good time with King Rurik II and his children. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.